I'm Scott Al Miller. It is the 19th of January, 2024. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. And today I had a viewer question. They wrote in and said, well, Scott, shouldn't what you be doing is supporting legislation to uh, make property ownership in Nicaragua something that can only be done by Nicaraguans, that foreigners cannot own property in Nicaragua? Well, I have to say as an expat who lives here, I want to say no. No, but this is a serious thing. So let's actually talk about, is this good and what we think about it? Because it's actually a pretty complex question. So we're gonna walk up this dirt road, enjoy a very beautiful day and discuss the future of property ownership in Nicaragua. Welcome to the show on a beautiful sunny day. It's actually pretty nice out. This is one of those days where I actually forgot to open the windows at home and forgot to turn on the air conditioning. And you do get pretty warm when you do that, but I made it for most of the day without even realizing that that was going on. And I was in meetings, so I had a headset on, which makes me way warmer than normal. It really wasn't too bad. It's great for coming out and walking right now, which I need to do. I need to get out and get some more exercise, so I'm trying to do this, but I've got a meeting coming up, so I don't have a lot of time. And, oh, of course, now it's windy. Hopefully, the sound is okay. So this is a real question, right? Why don't we limit the ownership of property to just Nicaraguans? This would protect against foreigners swooping in and buying up all of the land and all of the you know waterfront or whatever and making it that you know Nicaraguans don't have a place to live so this is a valid thing right especially small countries with large super rich neighbors United States Mexico these are these are major problems here in theory Americans could come in and buy all the land in Nicaragua and there'd be nothing left for the Nicaraguans so Certainly, so I, you understand the concern, right? It's, it's easy to see why presumably a Nicaraguan would have asked this question and would perceive this as a positive. And it certainly has positive aspects. We talk on the show a bit, um, and, and maybe these examples are what's prompting the question. Uh, but for example, in San Juan del Sur, there are famously developments that have been uh, purchased by uh, foreigners could be from anywhere. Uh, actually, in most cases, not the United States, actually in that case, but certainly some. And uh, they don't do anything with the land. They purchase prime land uh, when they can, when it's on a deal, right? Like, oh, the market's low, they swoop in, they buy a whole bunch of land, and then they never develop it. They leave it fallow. And this creates some major problems. It means that the locals, one, have no one to talk to to buy that land. Even if the seller wants to sell, or the, the owner wants to sell it, no one knows how to reach them because they're off in another country and they've often forgot about, forgotten about it because it, this often goes on for decades. Uh, you have the problem that if it's a development, well, if they don't have houses, they're unable to uh, to build everything up. They're unable to get the necessary uh, resources to put up enough houses to get the water supply, to get the electrical supply, to get the internet put in. And so it becomes impossible for anybody to build because no one's building. So it tends to completely kill off developments. And when you have an area like, we'll say the open space, oh, this is pretty dark, between Leon and Chenandega, buying up all of that land and doing something like this to it would be utterly impractical. It's so much land and it's just so open that it, it's not really a fear. But in a place like San Juan del Sur, where the amount of prime real estate is pretty limited, the number of places with views is really relatively limited, that people have done this uh, really causes a problem. It, see, I'm going uphill. It significantly impacts the local economy by reducing the number of people in the village, right? It's hundreds or thousands of residents of the village cannot be because the place where they'd like to live is not available at any price. No one knows how to get it. No one knows who would sell it to them, right? So, so that's one piece. Um, the the people who would live there and then would shop in the town and eat at the restaurants and stuff they're not there like this it's a major impact and so it's and, and this is prime real estate that should be going up and up and up in the country shouldn't be super high yet but someday right it's very prime but it's kept off the market in such a way that it, instead of everything going up everything's going down that's yeah, not the only factor and we'll talk about that but it is a factor and so these are things that are a fear uh, on other beaches here in the country you'll notice beaches is where it tends to happen right you have to have some really organized effort to do this in the wide open countryside but in prime spots with limited access like places with views or waterfront it's not that hard and there are beaches 
all of them that I know of are in Rivas. Is one of the reasons why we don't like the Rivas beaches is because this kind of stuff has happened there. Up here in the north, I don't know anywhere that it's happened. I'm not saying it hasn't, but I'm unaware of a single spot where anything like this has happened. But uh, on some of the beaches down in Rivas, uh, private companies or private investors or groups of private uh, owners have come in and bought up the entire waterfront and walled it off so that uh, when you drive through, you can't see it. When you live there, you can't get to it. And technically they can't, the beach itself is public, so they can't absolutely restrict access to it, but they can make it totally useless, right? There's no restaurants, there's no businesses, there's no bar, there's no place to buy water, no place to take a shower, no place to get to a bathroom. There's a tiny little path edging along a wall. It's ugly as all get out and you pop out onto a beach and behind you is just a wall. And it's horribly ugly and at what should be a beautiful beach is just a wall and some sand. And it ruins it for the people who want to live in that walled community because there's a wall between them and the ocean. And it ruins it for all the Nicaraguans because for all intents and purposes, that beach doesn't exist anymore. So this makes for a really strong argument for exactly what we're saying. Now, it's important to remember that these same things could happen with Nicaraguans. They're just much less likely and because they don't want to do that to everybody. However, many Nicaraguans do buy places, put up walls uh, and do similar things just on a much smaller scale. So it's worth, it's worth considering that it may not be because people are foreigners that this risk exists in this way. I'm walking up in Veracruz and as I'm recording this, I just came upon a lot that used to have a building on it and some walls and a bunch of stuff going on. And, and it, some of it was open, but a lot of it was not. And it shows that I don't walk up here often enough because it's now completely wide open. Some of it's been burned. It's all clear and there's just a ton of open space. It, this is a prime lot. I'm assuming someone is preparing to build here uh, and put in a mansion or maybe multiple houses, but there's enough room here for two really good sized houses. Or if you bought the whole thing, wow. Plus it's got three side access. It's got access to the main road of Veracruz, has access to the back road, like alley access of Veracruz. And then it has access to this little side road of Veracruz right here that, that I'm standing on. This is a really gorgeous spot. If someone's about to build here, they've, they've got they got some prime real estate and this has been just an empty lot in the middle of some of the most beautiful houses. So if this gets developed into something really sweet, it's going to, it's going to make such a difference because instead of, like I say, you always want to go find the spot that's worst in your neighborhood and, and turn it into the thing that's best because it, it does so much to change a street or a little, a little block or whatever. Uh, because it's the thing that everyone's like, well, all these beautiful houses, but then this ugly thing. And instead it's this, whoa. And then all these, yeah, just pretty houses, right? It's uh, you can flip so much of, of a small amount of real estate so easily. I mean, it's still a beautiful spot. It's not like it's ugly. It's just a big open lot. Of course, with all the ashes right now, it's not ideal, but it's uh, it's still not too bad. And that'll be grown over in a season. So it doesn't take a lot to come up with the idea that restricting foreign purchasing of property uh, is, is potentially a really good idea. And of course, the same things happen in, say, Managua. You take the best neighborhoods, and a lot of that is being purchased by expats. And then what is normally done and what was implied or said in the, in the post was, of course, there would be exceptions. For sure, they could rent. It's not about kicking out foreigners. It's just about ownership. And there, in most countries that do this, uh, there's an exception for condo ownership, where it's a a specific homeowners thing and you're only owning a part of a building and that you're allowed to do um, generally that's allowed it's almost universal and and that's what is proposed here and by proposed I mean by the person who said it I've never heard of anything like this uh, actually being put forward but who knows so uh, so there are ways to own and of course I'm sure there are loopholes where you end up with houses that are qualifying as, as condos. Who knows, right? That In the U.S., that could happen pretty easily. And it's just, wow, we, we reconfigured how the ownership is. And basically, the condo thing just becomes a glorified HOA. It depends. So, so is this a good idea? Well, my guess, my personal feeling, trying to not take it personally because I'm a gringo who owns property in Nicaragua and wants to live here and, uh, you know, all of that. Now, I am someone who I push rentals really heavily because I think 
uh, people foolishly purchase all the time. And, and we definitely want to help everybody, right? We want to do the right thing for Nicaragua, and we don't want to make people make stupid business decisions that makes them not want to be here or not be able to stay here because they've made foolish uh, business decisions or whatever. So we're trying to do the right thing for everybody, but how do we do that? And is restricting ownership a good answer for that? So I have some thoughts on that because this is a space that I know to some degree, and you have to look at the bigger economic impact, and you have to look at why other countries have done this. So Let's dig into this and let me give the reason. So I, very clearly there's, there's reasons that it's positive, right? But uh, it's a hairy subject, not only because you have existing owners, well, what happens to them, right? And I don't know what other countries have done. I don't know how transitions have been, uh, but that becomes very difficult. Um, and, and anything like that, um, it brings a lot of complications. No matter what, it's going to be hard and expensive. So you want to be very cautious making these kinds of decisions because they are things that impact you, not just for a generation, but for hundreds of years. And um, a, a, a misstep in this type of direction can be absolutely crippling. I actually brought my phone with notes on it so that I could make sure I'm covering this well because there's just a lot of things going on. So first of all, one thing that I want to point out is there's only five countries in the world that do a regime like this where only locals uh, can buy property and like China, the Philippines, Thailand, they're very specific uh, examples. And, and basically, one thing is that all countries that do this are in Asia. I'm not aware of any of them being outside of Asia. Um, and they are all places with really enormous populations, places where there is no shortage of people who live there wanting uh, to buy houses and, and, and do things. They're just extremely large, very urban populations. So that, that's very important to uh, understand that what we're talking about is uh, would be experimental in a context in which no one has ever approached something like this before. Um, it is uh, the difference between like a China or a Thailand. You know, they sound so different, but they are more similar than they are to Nicaragua. Nicaragua would be like a very small county in a far-flung province that is considered empty in either of their cases. These are giant countries with massive populations, nothing like in Nicaragua. So we're not talking about something where we can say, well, it worked for China, because one, I don't know that China would agree that it worked for them. Maybe they would. Right? I'm not digging into whether their example ended up paying off, but it is certainly a giant risk that China took, and it makes them a very different economy than other places. Um, and their, their needs and their ability to do that are as opposite from Nicaragua as you could imagine. So even if it was great for them, it does not imply it would even function in Nicaragua, but we can't look at those places and say, oh, it worked great for them, so we want to do that. If anything, they are also places I would be very unlikely to want to buy. China a little bit more, but they're all places that are extremely different culturally uh, and ideologically than Nicaragua. They are places that have um, a great degree of big government. The government oversees everything, makes all the decisions. Um, and I'm not saying that that's good or bad, but it is extremely the backwards from Nicaraguan culture in how it reacts with government. Uh, Nicaragua wants small government. It wants uh, more freedom and it's and you feel it, right? One of the things that draws expats here, one of the things that makes Nicaraguans so happy is that they have an incredible degree of freedom compared to a lot of other countries and places like the United States. One of the reasons that a lot of Nicaraguans don't fit in great there is that they're used to having so much flexibility and then going to a country where there's so many rules and so much control, you feel it. And if you think that's a lot of control going to a place like Thailand, where there's a, a much more government control, much more government oversight and intervention in things. Um, you feel that as another step again. Uh, those kinds of things are important that in order to do things like, like have such strict regulations on basic ability to buy and sell property in a country uh, risks taking the country down a path that is very different than the one it's on. Um, and you may run into some very significant cultural backlash uh, in doing something like that. So it's something to consider. That doesn't mean it's true, um, but it is, it is a factor that no country that has done this is physically located in a region like Nicaragua. None of them are uh, demographically by population and, and urban density anything like Nicaragua, and ideologically, none of them are anything like Nicaragua. They may be partners, they may be very friendly countries, but they are so different in what they are as countries that it's a, it's a very different thing. So the first, 
uh, of points in the country. Um, this would trigger, no question, 100% guaranteed, a full-on real estate collapse. The country's already in the greatest collapse in the history of the country for real estate, so triggering a further collapse that is essentially impossible now uh, would, be, would be traumatic. Right now, the very small amount of foreign purchasing of property is one of the only things doing anything to prop up the real estate market. And it is mostly caused by the market has gotten so low that foreign investors are willing to come in. Under normal circumstances, the amount of foreign investment in real estate is extremely low here. So that, and it's even lower now, but it is the incredibly low prices that it seems like you wanna stem the tide on is the only thing that causing properties to sell at all. Uh, and right now, it's very important. Nicaragua is full of empty houses. And I know what you'll say, China is too, but it's different, right? China is building some stuff for very specific reasons. But in general, China needs housing. This is starting to change as their, as their population shrinks. But they, they have traditionally, when these laws went into effect, when they decided to do these things, they had a really large need for continuously more and more uh, uh, housing, foreign purchasing of housing, could result in a reduction of the available housing on the market. That's a very fearful thing in a China, for example, or a Thailand, where they may end up with the foreign owned housing raising prices or lowering availability and leaving uh, their own citizens without housing. That's a real risk that they, at least in the past, have had to contend with. In Nicaragua, we have the opposite, at least right now. There is so much empty housing and people who have houses often need to be able to sell them uh, that it's it's those factors are opposite in China the fear would be say an American might come in and say well I want a second house and I want it in China I mean that sounds awesome I would love a second house in China that sounds cool right what a, what a great thing to do for what are you doing for the weekend I'm heading to my uh, my condo in Shanghai like whoa cool man that is wow who does that right that would be really cool so the fear that you would do that and then oh it wouldn't be used most of the time but you have enough financial resources that you can leave an empty apartment there and take it off the market for the people who need to live there and if you do that in in large groups in single areas like in san juan del sur you can end up crippling the local economy oh well now they can't support a bakery and you can't support a coffee shop because there aren't the number of people coming and going in that area and so the result is that those communities start to collapse because they don't have the population density to have the nice services that make them nice to live in places like european villages that are often so quaint oh i love this little coffee shop and i get fresh bakery in the morning and there's a little restaurant at night those things can't be supported if you don't have that population that effect of taking away the ability to buy houses would have a knock-on effect with general investment. A lot of the investment that goes into the country, possibly the majority of it, at least that is done in an organic grassroots kind of way, involves a connection to property. Maintaining foreign investment when you cannot own the property that the business is located on is very difficult. It's still possible, of course, but if you're going to be investing in a hotel, a restaurant, a factory, you generally want to have some control of the land. Having to strike a deal with a, uh, a local landlord who's going to rent you a property is scary if you're a business that may invest millions of dollars into, say, a factory that cannot be moved. Uh, you you put in the money, you become successful, and then that local landlord has the ability to raise the rent unlimited based on the fact that you've now become successful. That's a very scary thing. And they can just price you out of the market, take all of your property because you had to abandon it because you're unable to move it. And now they've gotten a factory essentially for free. As a foreign investor, it basically guarantees that large infrastructure investments are off the table. I might be willing to invest in a food cart or a little tiny business that has very little possibility of large success, but to actually invest and employ a lot of people, I need not to own property for the sake of owning property because I think it's a good investment to own property, but in many cases, the majority of cases, I need to own property so that I have the control to make sure that I can't be extorted with high rent to push me out of a business that I built in the location. It is definitely a rare business. They exist for sure, but it is a rare business that can handle moving with any regularity, say every two or three years, and not have it be seriously impactful. It basically means that anything involved in food, retail, farming, agriculture, manufacturing, 
tourism, and so forth, is completely off the table for investment. These are all things that Nicaragua heavily pushes for investment. They want foreign investors in the space because it creates jobs, it brings in foreign money, and the ability to sell the land that goes with that is absolutely critical to getting that foreign investment. For a country that is already struggling to get the people to buy and invest in those things, taking away that core transaction would be very impactful. It also means that that source of revenue that for both individuals, if you own a house in Nicaragua, your dream is to sell to a foreigner, because even if they don't get gringo price, they'll still pay a premium, almost guaranteed, or at least they will complete a sale that someone locally in Nicaragua was unwilling to do. Many houses, even if you're selling it at, you know, you have a house that's worth $50,000, you're hoping to make 80,000 from the gringo. Uh, they, they know the price is 50, they offer you 50. In so many cases, they're the only buyer. You have no Nicaraguan who's going to buy that house. If you don't allow those foreign investors, you are stuck in a situation where the local people are not going to buy the house. So you're now stuck holding onto a house and that house that was worth $50,000 starts dropping. Maybe it's worth 45, maybe it's worth 40, maybe it's worth 20, because until you can find a buyer, that's what it's worth. And so you're looking at people either uh, facing a collapse of the market where the prices are dropping, the floor just drops out, or more likely, maybe a combination of both, is that lower uh, desirability houses simply become unsellable across the board. And what little bit of foreign investment was, was keeping that churning would be gone. And so you'd have a lot of people stuck holding onto houses that can't afford to maintain them. And you'd have a lot of houses start rotting away. Uh, and that's really something you want to avoid. That's, that's crippling to the economy because it takes people who are in vulnerable positions and makes them even more vulnerable. But at a larger scale, it means that, uh, you know, the factory example, maybe it's a large field out in the country and, you know, if they're going to sell it as a field, if they could find a buyer, it would take many years and it's worth maybe $500 an acre thousand dollars an acre and a factory comes along and they don't want to deal with negotiations they're going to pay you fifteen hundred two thousand an acre and just get a big block and be done with it that money instead of just being nicaraguans shifting money around from one nicaraguan to another that is thousands of dollars possibly hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars depending on the scale of the investment being brought in from the outside to join the economy when it's just uh, transactions between nicaraguans that transaction of selling and buying really does essentially nothing. The government might get some tax revenue off of it, but that does nothing for the economy. That's just shuffling money around and people have to pay the government for doing some paperwork. But when you sell to a foreigner, you're actually bringing money into the economy and growing the economy in a very meaningful way. And so it's really important for small countries like Nicaragua to have a source of foreign revenue in that way to be able to bring up the size of the economy so that there is more cash in the system to keep the wheels turning for more things. So those purchases like that, um, in, in a place like the United States, you don't realize that it does those things because the amount of foreign investment compared to the size of the existing economy is so small. Very few foreigners want to buy land in the US and as a percentage of everything, like it really is small. And the size of the US economy is so large, that's a drop in the bucket. But here in Nicaragua, it is the opposite. The percentage of foreigners who want to buy is relatively high, still not huge, but it's relatively high compared to the US. And the uh, impact of that on the economy is incredibly palpable. So it's an important thing to maintain and consider in every transaction that the sale of the property to a foreigner is very important for the economy and selling that to allow them to then invest on top of it is the bigger thing. So if you want that growth of the economy in the general global way, you have to have those things. Places like China or Thailand are able to get away from that. Thailand through massive amounts of manufacturing and massive amounts of tourism, and China without the tourism, but a scale of manufacturing that makes massive, completely not even a term. China does the majority of the world's manufacturing. So they have those things going for them, so they don't care about some other means to prop up the the economy. But in Nicaragua, it doesn't have manufacturing, it doesn't have, uh, uh, it doesn't have tourism on any scale, and, and it would, this would impact tourism very strongly. So that, uh, that source of revenue is critical for how the country operates today. Any law that would take that source of revenue away would need to accommodate some way to completely make up for that. And I don't know that there's anything that could be done to make up for that. That may be an impact so great that it is insurmountable. Another factor that is more significant, I think, than people think is that Nicaragua has no condos. It's not 100% true, there's a few, but there are a few. 
There's a few in San Juan del Sur. There might be one or two in Granada. There's a handful in Managua. And that is about it. There's not a single condo in Leon or in Chinandega or in Matagalpa or in Esteli or in uh, Hinotega or in, like I can go on and on. There are zero, not just a few, not it's not common. It doesn't exist. So the theory is that you replace home ownership of foreigners with locals owning condos uh, or owning uh, houses or whatever that they can rent to foreigners and then those that want to buy have to buy condos, which is basically a form of lease anyway. But this is problematic when you don't have condos already and you don't have any skill or labor or capability to manufacture them. It would be extremely difficult and take eight decades for Nicaragua to build enough condos to house the people who would be displaced by this process. The reality is they would simply lose those people. Almost all of them would be forced into exile simply because there was no housing for them. It would be a very difficult situation. There's also the problem that some of the main places that people live in the country, like Granada and Leon, are colonial cities, and building condos is not legal. Of course, you could build colonial houses and classify them as condos, but you're getting into weird situations, and it would be very difficult to convince people to purchase a room in a colonial house as a condo. It just wouldn't go over very well. And uh, so there's a practicality to how would you deal with the transition in a country like this, in a Thailand or a Philippines or a uh, China. They have endless condos. They have endless capacity to build more. Uh, they, this is not a problem for them. They're big, dense urban environments where modern high-rise condos or apartment buildings or things that can handle this kind of uh, living situation are abundant and normal and part of their culture and part of their landscape visibly and culturally. Here in Nicaragua, that would not fit culturally. People wouldn't really understand it. It is not what people are looking for. It would be a change of fundamental Nicaraguan culture. It would be a change to the fundamental building codes in many cities. And Managua, of course, can't go up. So building traditional condos can't be done in Managua either. It would have to be done very low lying, which of course is just a physical thing, but it presents more challenges. It is not easy in the way that it is in many other countries. It, we don't have those quick and simple answers. So it would be, um, I think most importantly, it would be a cultural shift for Nicaragua. The th all of the things that are necessary from the type of construction to be done, the way the economy works, and the way that people want to live, the way that they feel about their government, the way that they feel about each other, the way that they feel about foreigners, all of those things say that limiting foreign ownership of property in the way that a Thailand, a Philippines, or, or China can do uh, doesn't feel like something that a Nicaraguan would be very accepting of. They, the idea of that one little thing, oh, our land, we can own it, but once they realize they can't sell it, ownership becomes a very murky thing. It sounds like Nicaragua for Nicaraguans, but what it really says is that Nicaraguans don't really own their property and the right to sell it is not theirs. We think of it, we state it as the right to buy, but the reality is it's the right to sell. And so that is not something that I think very many Nicaraguans would be okay with when they realize that what they're being told is their dream of selling property to a foreigner who's going to overpay, that their hope of unloading that second house that they ended up with, uh, that their hope that their property is not going to deteriorate in value over the generations are all going to be gone. And their hope for new businesses and, and so many of their hopes and dreams won't be possible because we're taking that away. And yes, they're guaranteed that other Nicaraguans will own the land around them. There's other things that we can do, right? If our real goal is to improve property ownership and maintain better beach access, access, for example. We can pass better laws about walling off the beach and public access rules and uh, size of continuous lots and things like that. Um, for example, I would be totally in support as an owner in Las Penitas, um, you know, there is a fear that a bunch of hotels could get together and purchase large swaths of the beach and wall them off and make them very inaccessible. I would be very supportive of providing laws that guarantee visibility and, and beach access within you know every 50 meters, 100 meters, whatever, and that you can't build beyond that. And if you want to connect beyond that limit, yeah, maybe you're allowed to build bridges over the public walkway. Like, come up with something creative. Don't be overly uh, rule-based, right? There's some flexibility. The goal is to give the public access to the beach. Let's make sure that they can do that. I'm 100% in support of making Nicaragua as public and accessible and as beautiful and as clean and for Nicaraguans as possible. But I don't think that by creating an authoritative uh, real estate regime 
and taking away Nicaraguans' rights and freedoms to sell their property and to get maximum price for it and to bring in foreign investment are the ways that you do that. Those are things that start shutting down many of the institutions that they care about and fundamentally change Nicaragua at every level, right? That is not indicative of what the current uh, government is like. It is not indicative of what the government has been like. It is not indicative of what the culture is like. It is not indicative of Latin America as a whole. Uh, it, is, it is not fitting with what we see around us. Um, and I, I just don't, I don't imagine a world where Nicaraguans would be supportive of that type of move. I totally get the goal, and I agree there's some things that we could do to get a little bit more control and make empty lots and abandoned lots and, and controlled developments um, put into a position where you must keep things moving forward. You can't abandon it. You can't just let it go fallow. You can't destroy the economy because you were able to invest when others couldn't. You, you have some responsibilities uh, as part of the community. And if you've completely left and you're not part of the community, then you have to give it up. Maybe there's a guaranteed low price. Maybe you have to be uh, provide some. There's a lot of things, a lot of mechanisms that can keep it from being a terrible situation but can fix what we have now but i think we should be really cautious about becoming overbearing um and and fundamentally changing culture uh in such a dramatic way thanks for joining me like and subscribe get down there in those comments let me know what you think about this other other topics questions that you have definitely let me know and uh if you would post on social media that means a lot if you want to support the channel you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash scott allen miller just my name just like on the show comes directly to me there's a link down there too i put it on the screen it's all over the place that helps support everything we do here uh, and as always like and subscribe and i will see all of you tomorrow